all in this very, very short uh, commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Pastor Kay Walker, uh, Miss Erica Lanier, and uh, Mr. Preston Stewart. And Mr. Stewart, uh, let us uh, continue our conversation with you by having you to uh, give us some information in reference to the issue of discipline in the uh, school setting, because I think that uh, many of us recognize that there is quite a problem in terms of discipline in the system. And so let's talk about it from that perspective. Uh, that's another area in which I'm very passionate about, is the, the fact that students are presenting certain types of behavior that uh, they have to be disciplined and they have to be suspended uh, from school. Uh, they put in in-school -school suspension. Uh, my concept is and my theory is that the average child who has been suspended from school or punished in any kind of way will have the attitude that I I did the crime, I did the time, but your punishment didn't change my mind. Mm -hmm. So in some way, the school system has to uh, convince that child that he is tomorrow's America and that the discipline uh, problems he presents in school is standing in his way of his economics mm -hmm. in terms of him being able to support himself in a way that's fruitful for him. All the children have a dream, and I think the first step is that each child in school should be uh, uh, c uh, helped and convinced in what his goal is. Mm -hmm. He should decide whether he's going to be a doctor, a lawyer, mm -hmm. a nurse, even a, a mechanic, and have a goal in school. And when he uh, acts up in school, let him know he's threatening these, the, the economics of his survival mm -hmm. to the standpoint that, and once you convince a child of uh, that he's, and show him that it's up that it's, it, it's his profit, it profits him to behave a certain way in school to his advantage to have a certain attitude. And let him know that his attitude determines his altitude. Mm -hmm. And that you do certain things in the school that's uplifting, that's motivating, and inspiring. Uh, Mr. Lanier, when you think about uh, the uh, metropolitan school system and you think in terms of uh, being a female, uh, let's look at it from a female's perspective. What are some of the issues uh, in the uh, system within the framework of what we're talking about today? What are some of the issues in, in the system that uh, young females uh, are concerned about or should be concerned about? How, how does that work? Um, I think uh, a big factor, and especially since um, the Metropolitan Nashville Public School Board um, as recently as this year, has updated policies on zero tolerance. Um, and with the recent announcement that they're going to open up Twitter and th these other elements, no one is looking at social media and how detrimental it is to all of our youth, but especially our young ladies. Um, bullying is totally different than when we were in school and they pulled our pigtails or, you know, or pushed us or maybe tripped us. Um, there are some very nasty things 
that are communicated about these young ladies and to these young ladies. Um, and sadly, you know, we're hearing, you know, more, you know, attempts of suicide. Um, and also, uh, young ladies are not realizing that things that they may do in social media today, just as if you robbed a bank, will follow you in essence um, in the future. Um, I have a friend who um, deals with student aid, and she said that one of the first things they do before they decide whether or not they're going to give a, stu uh, give a student um, any type of financial aid is they go out on social media to see what type of student this is. So you could be a straight A student, never got in trouble, but because of one single misjudgment on social media, you know, be passed over for financial aid, for a job, um, or, or numerous other things. You know, Pastor, I think that that's one of the things that uh, we rarely think about in mm -hmm. terms of how detrimental some of this can be to our young people. And, and, and Absolutely. You know, Dr. Haney, here, here's what we want to really have the Metropolitan National Public School System feel. We want them to feel the presence of the Education Committee of the NAACP as well as the full backing of the NAACP when it comes to and relates to our children's education. We have an expectation, Dr. Haney, that if a person is in the school system as an educator, we have an expectation that when a parent send that child into that school system, that that child is being educated, that that child is being treated right, that child is being treated fairly, and, and being treated in, with a level of professionalism. We have an expectation that the principals in the system, when it comes to this zero tolerance thing, that they exercise more flexibility than they're exercising mm -hmm. instead of just booting the children out of the school system as a whole, you know, in, in, in terms of, and rather than trying to find a way to teach them. Well, uh, Mr. Stewart talks very well about uh, uh, this uh, character education. Mm -hmm. So if we got zero tolerance and you got uh, the possibility the potential of character education, which is active in some school system, I think in Texas mm -hmm. Houston and stuff like yes. that, mm -hmm. but why not here in Metro? This, these are things that we want to see implemented within the Metro Natural Public mm -hmm. School system because we want to be able to find a way to properly educate our children and we want them to be educated by trained professionals who's going to act in a professional manner it's not going to be disrespected uh disrespectful toward our children and the like because if, if those things are happening rest assured that the NAACP we're looking we're watching we're going to be at your meetings we're going to be in your face we're going to be where we need to be so that we can guarantee that a child a mother who sends her child a father who sends his child to the school system that they can have a reasonable assurance that when they go off to work and when they retrieve their child in the evening their child has been exposed to a, an, an, an environment that cares concerned and is properly educating that child and we don't, and we're not settling for anything less than that this is what we expect this is what we moving toward and this is what we going to accomplish in this situation. Very good. Mr. Stewart, uh, we've got uh, 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 three minutes. Let's start off uh, simply by summarizing some of the things that you would like to see done in reference to what we're talking about and then allow Ms. Lanier to uh, continue on and then we'll uh, wrap it up for the day. Uh, we also hear a lot of comments about when young people come to the uh, school environment mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of the behavior stems from parenting mm -hmm. and there's an implication uh, in terms of, uh, of imposing the idea that parents need to have parenting uh, uh, sessions mm -hmm. and so forth and so on like that. I, I would uh, venture to say that any parent, you can convince them they're not a good parent, no matter what kind of parent they are and what kind of parenting style they have. But to involve the parent in doing some things that would be conducive to helping that child uh, have uh, behavior in school that is, uh, allows him to matriculate in a positive way. In other words, uh, have, have his dinner ready when he's home. Uh, be able to provide a quiet place for him to study. And, and, and uh, uh, encourage your child, uplift your child, inspire your child, and motivate your child to feel that, uh, that education is very important in his life. In other words, when you do that, then you're going to realize some uh, gains in your investment as your child. Mr. Lanier, what do you think about that uh, in terms of uh, what can be done? Um, I think that, of course, all of, all of us need to be constructive in um, our input in terms of children, 
but I think also it's important that as taxpayers and voters mm -hmm. that we voice and hold accountable um, the administration that is duly responsible for educating all of our children. Mm -hmm. Especially as voters, and, and, and I think that all of us would agree that there is a political element within uh, the uh, school system in, mm -hmm. a, in a real sense, uh, common core, and et cetera, and et cetera. And I would imagine that each of you would uh, encourage uh, uh, more people to participate and find out exactly what's going on in reference to common core and to uh, try to do our best in terms mm -hmm. of making it viable in a real sense for uh, the children that, the, not only African Americans, but the children that are served mm -hmm. by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, 10 seconds, uh, over the last 10 seconds, uh, we've got 10 seconds, uh, uh, Mr. Stewart, give us a statement in 10 seconds. Ms. Uh, Lanier will also do the same thing. He will do the same, and I'm gonna wrap it up for today. We've got to convince our young people that they are tomorrow's America, mm -hmm. and that they must be serious about the education and that, that they must try to uh, in make their endeavors uh, to do the best they can to the highest of their ability. Ms. Lanier? It takes $9,200 a year to educate a child. It takes 23000 to house an inmate. We need to focus on being success stories, not statistics. Very good. And so cost effectiveness has a very important part in this. And of course, let me thank the three of you for coming by and giving us that excellent information. And let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning.
Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is Peace Ambassadors USA. And we have to uh, talk about Peace Ambassadors USA, Mr. Arafat, uh, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Mr. Arafat, uh, who is the Executive Director of uh, Peace Ambassadors USA, as well as the founder of that uh, organization. Uh, Mr. Y Yassar Ar S. Arafat, and of course, Mr. Arafat, let me uh, welcome you to uh, the uh, show this morning and to tell you how delighted we are to have you with us and to talk about what I consider to be a very, very important topic, and that is peace. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that you've got a program that you call Peace Ambassadors USA that uh, you'd like to talk to us about this morning. But before we get into that, Mr. Arafat, let's see if we could get uh, from you some information about your background, your education, and some of your experiences. And uh, <clears throat> then we'll, uh, by, the, by the end of this segment, we'll have an opportunity to to talk about the organization itself, Peace Ambassadors USA. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and the pleasure is all mine. Uh, my name is Yasser Saleh uh, Arafat. Mm -hmm. I was born in Yemen originally. Mm -hmm. I came as a teenager to uh, Brooklyn Heights, New York. Mm -hmm. And in 95, I came to Nashville, Tennessee, and it's been home since. Mm -hmm. I worked at the uh, Metropolitan Public Schools mm -hmm. as an ESL uh, parent liaison mm -hmm. for a few years. And then I became the Director of Education and Board Member of the Islamic Center of Nashville, mm -hmm. 1 12th Avenue, until 2010. We established another uh, Islamic Center called the Islamic Center of Tennessee, and I was one of the main founders and vice president. And then uh, 2012, we started the initiation and the beginning of the establishment of Peace Ambassadors USA. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually, I have a, uh, uh, my, educational backgrounds. Uh, I have an undergraduate degree from Middle Tennessee State University uh, in political science, um, actually pre-law, and uh, I have a uh, master in uh, Islamic uh, studies mm -hmm. and uh, planning to uh, start my doctorate in Vanderbilt for uh, political science and also JD because mm -hmm. I have a mm -hmm. and uh, basically uh, that is uh, kind of what I do. It's uh, I go and give lectures in colleges, universities uh, using my uh, uh, background in, in, in Middle East or whether uh, mm -hmm. in the United States uh, in religion and politics. Uh, uh, we use the degree in politics basically to talk about politics in the Middle East mm -hmm. and we use the degree mm -hmm. of uh, Islamic studies to talk about uh, interfaith dialogues and mm -hmm. programs and trying to reach out. We go to churches, we go to colleges, we go to schools, we invite people and churches to our mosques mm -hmm. and that's, that's basically what the, what the background of education. Mm -hmm. uh, my plan is to finish the doctorate and again use it in the same way mm -hmm. of reaching out to the mm -hmm. public, whether mm -hmm. here or overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, religious background uh, gave me the chance to also become a, uh, 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 as we call it in Arabic, khatib. I mm -hmm. give uh, Friday sermons. Mm -hmm. uh, I give it uh, here in Nashville, Tennessee, and I give it in different states. Every Friday you'll see me traveling to one state. And I do it as a volunteer, basically. Uh, um, I'm not going to qualify myself and go and say I am an imam. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not what I would call myself, but I would call myself as a religious educator mm -hmm. and a communicator. Mm -hmm. uh, also, my involvement in the community for the last 17, 18 years gave me that, that leverage to know what the needs are. So I became a community developer. Mm -hmm. uh, I help those who want to establish uh, uh, institutions uh, whether in the state or outside the state. So there is a group of uh, 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 individuals who would like to start a religious institution or a non-religious institution, a non-profit, since we studied that. I go and help them, again, volunteering. Uh, so that's basically... Uh, the well, you know, uh, uh, the uh, important thing here, I think, is that uh, you've been involved in trying to create a situation to bring peace among people for a long time, I would imagine. And, yes. and, and out of this came uh, the organization Peace uh, yes. Ambassadors USA. Yes. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, let's start off. We've got about uh, a minute before the uh, end of this segment. Mm -hmm. But sort of give us an overview uh, uh, of what that organization is about. And when we come back after this commercial break, we'll allow you to go deeper into the organization. Absolutely. Well, it's basically an American Islamic outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and others need to start learning about each other from each other rather than from Van Damme and Chuck Norris movies, mm -hmm. and as you know what I mean. Uh, it's, it's, it's an establishment that would bring people together 
uh, it will facilitate and foster a better communication and a better interfaith dialogue. Mm -hmm. so Very good. And of course, we're going to take our first commercial break. And we're going to take this first commercial break and we'll be back with you following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Mr. Arafat, uh, who has given us some information in reference to an organization that he has founded called Peace Ambassadors uh, USA. And uh, Mr. Arafat, let me welcome you back to uh, the second segment Thank of the you. show for today. I think I might have said the third segment, but for, through the second segment of the show for today, and to uh, let you have about uh, six or eight minutes to uh, talk about this organization that uh, you are the founder of, as well as the executive director, and uh, give us some idea in terms of what you expect to accomplish and how that idea came to you, and et cetera, all in eight minutes. Yes. Basically, uh, after 9-11, it, it was a changing factor to a lot of people. It really uh, taught us the essence and the importance of communication. We remember, before 9-11, we used to go to churches and colleges and reach out and do interfaith uh, programs. And after 9-11, a lot of members of my community were really uh, afraid of what the consequences would be. But the amazement, the amusing, amusing thing that happened is that we had a lot of cooperation and solidarity from the community where we had the front door of our Islamic center full of flowers and roses and uh, greeting cards standing by us. and acknowledging that we had nothing to do with 9-11. Now, that was the beginning of what made me really think about this project. But really, what brought it up to the time to, to, for it to be initiated was in 2008. I was an undergraduate student at Middle Tennessee State University. And we had a class uh, of English literature. And the professor, and this is what I do usually, I always reach out, go mm -hmm. to school, and uh, whatever I meet a professor, I give him some uh, uh, information about my background, my history, and mm -hmm. this is what I'm used to do. Mm -hmm. So I gave it to him, and uh, the next class, he said, Mr. Arafat, can I have a few minutes? Mm -hmm. I said, of, of course. So he started asking me questions, and mm -hmm. I answered those questions. I was pleased that he did. Mm -hmm. uh, second class. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sarah Fat, can you got a few more I mean, uh, minutes? I said, of, of course. And basically, we, every class, we mm -hmm. sit down for five, ten minutes to talk about Middle East, mm -hmm. religion, and on. I was surprised that in the middle of the, uh, uh, the midterm exam, mm -hmm. he chose one of the topics which we talk, uh, talked about, mm -hmm. which was women in Islam. Mm -hmm. I was so pleased that he did. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to give the presentation about it, but someone else ended up taking it. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that is what happened. When the time came for that presentation to take place, the person who uh, took over the, the, this topic stood up, but didn't do a good job, basically. Mm -hmm. And instead of talking about women in Islam, mm -hmm. that person talked about women in Saudi Arabia. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so the professor said, stop, stop. I mean, I asked you to write a paper about women in Islam, not women in Saudi Arabia. So right. uh -huh. Where you got your information from? She said, from the internet. Well, anything you get from the internet is something that you take as face value. Mm -hmm. 
you're a person who's about to graduate and you need to, you know, ex exert some more efforts to verify what you get. So he asked the person to rewrite the paper, but he did something that really was the beginning of the mm. idea of Peace Ambassador. He stood up and said, well, first of all, you need to, you need to rewrite the topic. Mm -hmm. Second, for your information, women in Islam were given their rights 1400 years ago. Mm -hmm rights that only were given to you 60 years ago and you're still fighting for it. Mm -hmm. You need to learn to understand and differentiate between what some Muslims do and what their religion teaches. Mm -hmm. Now that was very touching to me. Mm -hmm. And that's when the light bulb came to my head. I said, well, what about if I start a program mm -hmm. to reach out to professors, to uh, churches, to teachers, and try to educate them about the real teaching of Islam, not what they see on TV and in other places. And that's when the idea of Peace Ambassador. So we went ahead in April of 2012. We, uh, uh, it took time because I, I was so busy with the, the project before that, which is the Islamic Center of Tennessee, and I was busy before that with the Islamic Center of Nashville. So it became, uh, it's not it, it, a dream, a live dream. It took a while to be, it took, it took a while, it to took a while and it was, it was accomplished, mm -hmm. thank God for it. So we did, we signed up, and uh, we started. Now, at the beginning, we used one of our mosques. Still continuing to do visitations, visit churches and stuff. But what ends up happening, we needed a place because the dream is big. We want to have our own radio station. We want to have our own IMAX theater. We want to have our own programs where we're going to be providing free Arabic classes, free English classes, free Spanish classes, mm -hmm. free legal consultations, free domestic violence consultations, soup kitchens. We want to have our own uh, 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 free legal, legal consultations mm -hmm. and all these things. We want to show the community the true face of our religion through interaction and services. Mm -hmm. See, this is something that I always say to my brethren. We talk a lot, but when the time comes for action, we, we don't do enough action. We need to change that. We need to get out of that box of self-imposed isolation as a community and start reaching out to the one people around us. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I went to a church a few months ago in a nearby state of Nashville. And uh, usually before I go to a church, I check the background of the church, mm -hmm. what kind of denomination, even the age difference, mm -hmm. and male or female. It helps to cater the speech to fit your audience. Very good. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the time to do so. So I said, okay, I'll just go. <laughs> and when I got there, usually I start by cracking a joke. And my name is, it really cracks a joke. Mm -hmm. My name is Yasser Arafat, yeah, a well-known mm -hmm. name, yes, mm -hmm. no, no relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do, I say, well, Thank you very much for inviting me. Salam, shalom, peace. Mm -hmm. my, name is, my name is Yasser Arafat. No relationship to the Palestinian leader. Uh -huh. Usually people laugh. Mm -hmm. That church, nobody laughed. Uh -huh. I said, oh my God, what I got my... <laughs> <laughs> so good. right away I switched the, 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 uh -huh. the, the style of approach. Mm -hmm. So I said, first, thank you for inviting me. Second, I got a question. It's a silly question, but please bear with me. Mm -hmm. Who of you know, where did Jesus Christ come from? Mm -hmm. And of course, they all raised their hands. Where from? Um, Jerusalem. I said, correct, where mm -hmm. is Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. It's in the Middle East. I said, wonderful, wonderful. Now, where do you think I come from? Uh, probably from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I said, correct. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you really think that Jesus Christ, who came from the Middle East, would most likely look like me or you? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and the atmosphere completely changed. Mm -hmm. I said, the reason I'm saying this is just, just in case there is any kind of prejudice, mm -hmm. Please remove it and uh, listen to us. Who, that uh, is the message of Peace Ambassadors, mm -hmm. reaching out, bringing people together, mm -hmm. educating about, about, about our, ourselves from each other rather than from someone else. Very good. And of course, you started this organization in, in 20... Uh, uh, in, in, in April 2012. 2012. And, yes. uh, and the organization is growing now and you're reaching out. Uh, are you the only uh, uh, person no. that, that's involved in that yeah, organization? Yeah, or have okay. you got a core of No, we have, individual we have a board. We have a board. Uh, we have a, a the executive committee. We have a uh, board of directors. And by the way, we purchased the building. We are at the beginning. We're about to have an initial opening this Saturday, the 22nd of March. Very good. And of course, we're going to take our uh, first, second commercial break. Thank and you. then we're going to come back and talk. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break.
Thank you and welcome to the final segment of the show for today. The name of the uh, topic for today is Peace Ambassadors USA, and we're fortunate to have with us the founder and executive director of Peace Ambassador USA, Mr. Yasser S. Arafat, uh, who has given us some information about his background and some and the uh, founding of this organization. Now, Mr. Arafat, let's look at some of the uh, issues that I'm sure that uh, your organization has had to deal with uh, dealing with the uh, Middle East. And let's talk about what we might, you might consider some of the most important issues in the Middle East over the next eight or 10 minutes. Basically, if you look at the foreign policy of the United States of America in the Middle East, I mean, uh, from study and from reading and from understanding the, 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 the issue, you find there are two major things that we deal with in the Middle East. Oil and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Mm -hmm. These are the two major things. Oil has been secured. We have good relationship with, with the region, the, the, at least the governments of the region, and so we have a good flow, so we're not going to have to go through the embargo of the 70s. Mm -hmm. And second is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and this is, to be honest with you, is the crucial, uh, uh, the most important issue in that part of the world. I see our foreign policy of our government failing, and it has been failing for a long time. It's unfortunate to say that. And it's failing because there is no genuineness involved. Mm -hmm. Once we become a just broker to reach peace, it becomes much easier for us to bring people on the table. Mm -hmm. When we are just and we are equal to both parties, mm -hmm. things will take place, peace will materialize. Without justice, equality, respect, peace cannot be mm -hmm. in place. You can't expect to come to take over my land, mm -hmm. prosecute me, kill me, starve me, mm -hmm. and then have peace my mm -hmm. way or the highway. Mm -hmm. I believe that as a great, the greatest country in the world, mm -hmm. that greatness comes with a huge responsibility. Whether we like it or not, we do have a responsibility in that part of the world mm -hmm. because one, we are one of the reasons that we are the, the only or the most, the main supporter of the state of Israel, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So we should have some kind of leverage if we want to use it. I understand APAC and other lobby, you know, uh, lobbyists do have an impact in Congress and the White House, but still, the national interest of the United States of America should come first before mm -hmm. any other national interest of any other entities. Mm -hmm. I believe, this is what I believe, and I'm sure there are many people out there who believe such a thing, that 9-11, for example, is a direct result of our foreign policy in that part of the world. 9-11? 9-11, so? I do believe that mm -hmm. very, very strongly. Why do I believe this? If you look at what the terrorists do and say, mm -hmm. they do use the Palestinian cause to mm -hmm. recruit terrorists, to do a lot of things. And that Palestinian cause and dilemma really do, or does resonate in the hearts of the Arabs. There are 300 million Arabs who do not like the state of Israel. They mm -hmm. consider it to be a cancer in the heart of the Arab nation. Go back to history. That's not the case. A lot of people think that all oh, the Arabs and the Jews have been fighting each other for thousands mm -hmm. of years. That's, that's mm -hmm. not correct. The Arabs and the Jews are cousins. Mm -hmm. The Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael. The Jews are the descendants of mm -hmm. Isaac. And both mm -hmm. are the children of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Peace be upon them all. So that is, in, you look again, near history, 18th century, 19th century, when the, when the Israelites and the Jews were, were put in ghettos in Europe, their cousins welcomed them with open arms. So they came, they settled in Turkey, they settled in Yemen, in Morocco, and other places. So there is no this hate, you know, hate relationship. There is, as a matter of fact, there is a beautiful um, uh, organization, uh, I think of Hasidic Jews, who, uh, who stand up and say the truth as is. Mm -hmm. They said that we used to babysit for the Arabs and ba they babysit for us when we used to go to the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. This the kind, that's kind of the relationship they used to have until the Zionist movement came and whatever happened, happened. So I believe that as a, a greatest country in the world, mm -hmm. with our President Obama, who we respect even though we disagree with a lot of her policy, his policies, especially in the Middle East, I believe there is a chance for peace. I went to a synagogue a while back to give a talk, mm -hmm. and I stood up and I said, I want to start an experiment with you, my friends. Close your eyes and visualize the following. Mm -hmm. Two little babies, nine months old, both naked, 
both with a bullet in the middle of their chest. Mm -hmm. They're both dead. They're being washed, cleaned, and prepared to be buried. Mm -hmm. Now, one of them is an Arab and the other one is a Jew. Would you please tell me which one is? Which is which? <laughs> You cannot. No. Mm -hmm. You can't. These both innocent babies being killed, killed by, by bullets. Mm -hmm. Who's to blame? The babies? No, us. What have we done to reach out? If we do not become a just broker and reach out and use the leverage that we have against Israel mm -hmm. and bring them together to the table for them to compromise and accept the UN resolution. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've read this, the, in 2002 in the Beirut summit, the Arab summit, Arab League, there was a Saudi initi initiative mm -hmm. which told Israel, accept the UN resolutions, go back to the 1967 borders, mm -hmm. allow the Palestinians to have their own states, and we will normalize all relationships mm -hmm. with the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. We will recognize the state of Israel, we'll open borders, and we'll have just a regular relation just like mm -hmm. any other state. Question is, why didn't Israel accept mm -hmm. such a mm -hmm. thing? They say the Arabs don't want a peace, the Arabs don't want peace. That is not true. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunately, that is not true. But what we need to do right now is to ask our government, and in particular our President Obama, to really make better choices for our own safety in this country. There is a lot of resentment, and if we do not reach the peace of hands, and that's what we're going to try to do in Peace Ambassadors, reach out to people here and over there and tell them, hey, as people, we could create a powerful segment of society where we could influence the decisions that are made in the government. We want to live in peace, mm -hmm. but we want to also let others live in peace. Mm -hmm. If we come into the Palestinians and say, as American people, which I believe American people, I was in Kuwait last year and I said something on the radio. Mm -hmm. I said American people are the most generous, most God-loving people I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the person who was giving the interview was like, are you sure? I said, yes, I am one of them. Mm -hmm. So again, they don't know us like we don't know no them. Mm -hmm. And through these kind of reach out programs and communication and peace ambassador programs, I think we could foster a better way of mm -hmm. reaching out and getting to know each other. I was one day in a, in a church and one of the, the, the people there asked me, Mr. Arafat, why do you guys worship statue? Mm -hmm. See, they, they think that Muslims worship a statue, his name is Allah and that is the moon god. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have the, the crescent on the top of the buildings. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do, we, we don't have such a thing as in, with the moon god. So I don't blame them, to be honest with you. Because I blame, they don't know. They right? don't know. Mm -hmm. I blame myself and the Muslims mm -hmm. in general. What have we done to reach out? Mm -hmm. When was the last time you knocked the door of your neighbor and told them, hey, I'm a Muslim, would you like to come for dinner? Mm -hmm. When was the last time you talked to your classmate or coworker or whatever? A lot of Muslims shy away. And again and again and again, I do blame myself and mm -hmm. my community for not reaching out more. And we are planning to change that. And so you believe that the organization that you are the founder and the executive director, uh, the uh, <coughs> Peace Ambassadors in USA, mm -hmm. can play a significant role in terms of uh, reaching out and, and, and making people understand both sides of any kind of question that might be raised dealing with uh, any problems that you might have in the Middle East. Is absolutely. That, is that what we're saying? Absolutely. What we're going to do, we're going to start with our own, our mm -hmm. own neighbors next door. Mm -hmm. That's where we start building those kind of mm -hmm. good relationships. You can't just reach out to, to next city when you have problems with your own people mm -hmm. next door. Mm -hmm. You're going to start with your own, those who are around you. We're going to start by reaching out, educating, mm -hmm. creating these programs, having something called intellectual club mm -hmm. where we bring professors and we bring mm -hmm. doctors and other people with professions to give lectures and talk from all faiths and backgrounds. We will host that and we will help and f facilitate mm -hmm. such, such action. We believe by continuing to do such thing, things will change. Mm -hmm. Might not happen tomorrow, mm -hmm. but you're going to start somewhere. It's better. Look, look at the right. civil rights movement, movement in the United uh -huh. States. Look at all these movements that started. Mm -hmm. They didn't just happen overnight. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of sacrifice and a lot of time that took mm -hmm. place. But again, this is the land of dreams, and we believe we can And so you it. do believe that you've got an organization that people can buy into, and it would do quite a bit in terms of at least moving toward bringing some kind of understanding between peoples Absolutely. in the Middle East. And, and we believe that anyone could become an ambassador regardless, regardless of your faith and background. And let me thank you, and let me encourage our audience uh, to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you, and good morning.
because I understand that uh, 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 all night session, not well, quite recently, did. Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic today is the politics and consequences of climate change. And we're fortunate to have with us to talk about the politics and consequences of climate change, Professor David Padgett from uh, Tennessee State University. Uh, Dr. Padgett, let me uh, welcome you to the show this morning. And to tell you how delighted we are to have you here because uh, I think the topic that we're gonna talk about uh, is a very, very important topic and quite a number of folks are involved in it uh, one way or the other. And so let's have you to start off by uh, giving us some information. You've been with us before, but there might be some members of our audience who might not know that much about you. And so give us some information about your background, your education, and some of uh, your experiences. And then by that time, we should be able to get into that second segment. Then we'll talk about politics and consequences of uh, climate change. But during this first segment, let's talk about David Padgett and some of the things that you've been involved in and et cetera. Okay, well, I earned my um, undergraduate degrees in geography and geology from Western Kentucky University. Uh, and I worked for the federal government for a while as a physical scientist. Uh, and then I did my graduate degrees, master's and PhD in physical geography and geology and environmental engineering. Uh, and so I guess my academic training is primarily in what we would call earth system sciences. Uh, I helped to start the environmental geography program at Austin P State University. Uh, I also taught in the environmental studies program at Oberlin College. And following Oberlin College, I came to Tennessee State University 15 years ago and I've been teaching weather and climate at Tennessee State University. Uh, weather and climate is part of Earth system science. Um, for the past 10 years, uh, I've taught weather and climate. I've been a member and participant of the American Meteorological Society's uh, climate diversity and climate weather projects, uh, the objective of which is to expand the numbers and increase the numbers of people of color specifically uh, African Americans at, and people at HBCUs mm -hmm. in studying climate science and, and weather studies. So I've been in that program funded by the American Meteorological Society for the past uh, 10 years. Uh, I'm also a uh, certified weather spotter, so I'm one of the people that goes out and, and tries to warn 
the community of uh, tornadoes and hail and other violent weather uh, when it comes into our area. Now, when you say that you're a certified weather spotter, now what does that mean? I mean, to be certified in reference to that? Uh, well, the uh, National Weather Service periodically has trainings for anybody, any citizen who is interested in uh, being out there on the ground looking for tornadoes especially. Uh, Tennessee is one of the places in the United States where you're most likely to be killed by a tornado. Uh, we were the number one state until Alabama surpassed us a couple of years ago. Uh, so tornadoes can be very deadly events here. And even though a lot of news stations have radar, uh, radar only detects tornadoes that are very close to the radar stations. The farther you get away from radar stations, you really need to have people and human beings on the ground with, with eyeballs to see these tornadoes. So even with all this technology that we have, we still need humans such as myself to mm -hmm. spot the tornadoes and report in to the uh, weather stations, hey, you know, there's a tornado on the ground in Dixon County or there's a tornado on the ground here that may or may not even show up on radar. And so in a real sense, you uh, go out when there's a danger of a storm, excuse me, and, and you go out and you search and, and, and you call back in and, they, and, and now that's, that's sort of a dangerous kind of situation because, well, because it means that you come put yourself in, in, in the line of these uh, storms and tornadoes. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm not a storm chaser. Uh -huh. I'm not a tornado chaser. Uh -huh. If I happen to be at work at Tennessee State University uh -huh. and a storm is coming, uh, then I'll look out, you know, I'll take cover, but I will watch uh -huh. the skies. If I'm at home or wherever I happen to be, I'll be watching the skies. And since we have cellular phones now, mm. I would be able to call in uh, and say I'm a certified spotter and here's what I'm seeing occurring mm. on the ground at this location. Uh -huh. uh, and then that way, the warning would go out that not only do we see a possible tornado mm -hmm. using the radar, but there's someone who sees the actual tornado on the ground. And by being a certified spotter, I mean, that gives you more credibility when you call and say and announce that you are what, a certified spotter? Oh yes, I've been through training. Uh, not just anybody uh -huh. can call in. Yeah, the that's, yeah, yeah it uh -huh. has to be someone who's been through the training. Training yeah. with, with the experience and et cetera, know what they're talking about. Exactly. And that when the people on the other end receive it, that, that has great credibility being certified other than if I were to call and say, Look, like we might have a tornado over here i'm not certified they no, probably wouldn't pay yeah you wouldn't get you wouldn't have that there's okay. one phone number that we call okay but let, let we'll go take this first commercial break and then we'll get back into and we'll uh have our second first commercial break and we'll be back with our audience following this very very short uh, commercial break Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Professor David Paget from Tennessee State University, and the topic is the politics and consequences of climate change. Uh, Dr. Paget, before we had our first commercial break, we promised that we'd give you an opportunity to talk about what we consider to be the politics and consequences of uh, climate change. And I think the reason we decided to entitle this uh, the politics and consequences of uh, climate change is because quite, quite recently there was a, an all-night session in the United States Senate dealing with this issue of climate change, and we therefore felt that it was time to again have you in to uh, talk to our audience again about what it means or what climate change is and what uh, the politics of it and some of the consequences of uh, the climate change. And so, so from that perspective, let's do it that way. Okay, well, first I'll start off defining some terms. Uh, first some people use the term as weather and climate interchangeably. Weather relates to the first of the atmospheric conditions in a very localized place, such as Nashville. You know, and so, but climate is over a much wider area and usually over a much longer period of time. So when we talk about climate, we're not talking about atmospheric conditions right here, right now. We're talking about what have the atmospheric conditions been over the past 100 years or 1,000 years or even 10,000 years. Uh, 
The next couple of terms I want to define are climate change and then global warming. Uh, global warming is the more controversial of the two because that means that uh, apparently the Earth's average atmospheric temperatures are warming, which they absolutely are. But when you start to say global warming, people start to get, oh, it's, you know, it's, uh, that's a little scary for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, so oftentimes people use the term climate change mm -hmm. because the climate is constantly changing. Uh, the Earth has been through several ice ages, so the Earth's temperature has gotten warmer, and it's gotten cooler, and then warmed up, and then the you know, ice melted, and so on and so forth. Um, now, what's controversial about climate change and or global warming uh, is, the cause, is the cause of it. Uh, now, there is no debate over whether or not the Earth's average temperature has been warming. If you look at all the evidence, uh, if you look at the past couple of decades, we've had the warmest decades, warmest months we've ever had in recorded history. Uh, so the debate is not over whether the, cl 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 the climate is getting warmer or not. We definitely know that. The question is, is it human cause or is it natural? Uh, now, if it's human cause, that means that we humans are releasing greenhouse gases such as uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, what carbon dioxide does is it absorbs long wave radiation. Mm -hmm. And it's that long wave radiation that warms the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So in theory, the more carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, the warmer the atmosphere is going to become. Mm -hmm. We humans put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through burning fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. We drive our cars, we burn coal. About half of our electricity is produced by burning coal. So we engage in a lot of activities that pump carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The question is, are we pumping so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we're causing the climate to change, that we're causing, uh, that we're putting so much extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that it's absorbing excessive amounts of long wave radiation and pushing our temperatures higher and higher, which eventually will melt the mm -hmm. polar ice caps, which is melting glaciers, which will cause sea level rise and mm -hmm. any number of consequences. Uh, there are some relationships between climate change and, mm -hmm. and weather, mm -hmm. such as hurricanes. Uh, hurricanes are predicted to become more powerful. Mm -hmm. They might not become more frequent, but definitely as the ocean warm waters warm, we might see uh, years such as year 2005 we had hurricanes Rita and Wilma and of course Katrina which were some of the most powerful hurricanes and the largest hurricanes we've ever seen in recorded history um, but the question comes in to play as to whether humans are significant enough factors on this planet to cause the climate to change. change. Mm -hmm. Because, like I said before, when humans weren't on the Earth, the Earth warmed up, cooled down, we didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, one volcano can put enough greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, it would be an equivalent amount of humans mm -hmm. putting that amount in the atmosphere through our activities. One volcano. Mm -hmm. uh, one volcanic eruption historically has changed the climate for years afterwards. Mm -hmm. We humans, aren't necessarily able to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, what it all boils down to is money. If we humans are causing the climate to change and of course causing global warming, uh, the way that we mitigate that is with pollution control, is that we pay for devices that will keep greenhouse gases from escaping. Those devices are very expensive. Uh, for example, there's a coal plant right here in Gallatin, Tennessee, that's being retrofitted so that it will not produce as much greenhouse gas. For that one plant, the retrofit is $1 billion. That's a billion dollars for one plant in Little Gallatin, Tennessee. So just think about the cost all across over the nation. The nation. All... Mm -hmm. We're talking about um, uh, amounts of money that are unfathomable. Big business and industry, they do not want to pay that money if it's a natural cause. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to find out from a scientist 20 years from now, oh, you know all those billions <laughs> of dollars you spent? Oh, oh that, we were mistaken. This is all natural. The earth is warming up all by itself. Mm -hmm. We humans don't have anything to do with it. So, and the money in politics comes into play in that, of course, the United States 
Uh, we are a massive producer of fossil fuel, I mean, excuse me, of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are other countries such as China and India that are right now having their own industrial revolutions. Mm -hmm. They're starting to get more involved in manufacturing, less involved in agriculture, and they're starting to pump tons and tons and tons of, of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't want to slow down. They don't want to slow down any more than we wanted to slow down during our industrial revolution here. Uh, and so they're less apt on the global scale to be involved in anything that's going to sound like pollution control because pollution control costs money, pollution control cuts into profits. Uh, and so the United States is sort of caught in the middle mm -hmm. because certainly we like to see these normally lower income countries develop, mm. but, and we like their products. I mean, we get lots and lots of products from, from China. Mm -hmm. we, we are very much involved in business in India, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, that progress is causing pollution. Mm -hmm. And you can see what's happening in Beijing right now. Where they, they're barely, hardly able to see because the air is so bad. Okay, we're gonna take this uh, second commercial break. <clears throat> we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. 